Um, so today we're going to start chapter 11. So in chapter 11, we're going to be talking about the complex numbers. Kind of in some more detail. So when we talk, up, or we'll start kind of just reviewing what a complex number is. So when we talk about the complex numbers, those are the things of the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers, and i is the imaginary number that's equal to the square root of negative 1. So remember that our definition for the complex numbers includes all of the real numbers, right? Because if b is equal to 0, then you just have a real number, right? And if a is equal to 0, we have something called a pure imaginary number where there's no real component to it. There's just like 5i or 3 over 2i or whatever. There's just an imaginary part to it. So this complex numbers include both of those two things. Um, so remember back in like, you know, elementary school, they'd be like, which number is bigger? You'd have like three or four. What would you say here? You'd say four because three is less than four. What if we asked you the same number or the same question, but we said like three plus two i or two plus three i? Which is bigger? The question doesn't make sense, right? The question doesn't make sense. And the reason it doesn't make sense is that you can't order 3 plus 2i and 2 plus 3i like we can the numbers just 3 and 4, right? If we think about the numbers 3 and 4, we can place them on a number line where one number precedes the other. How would we plot 3 plus 2i and 2 plus 3i on a number line? You can't, because there's like a real part and an imaginary part to it. So if we wanted to try to find a visual representation for these two numbers, what we'd have to do is use a two-dimensional graphing system. So the x is going to be like our real axis. So we'd plot the real number part on the x-axis. And the y is the imaginary axis. So that's where we'd plot the imaginary part on. So like 3 plus 2i would be here. And 2 plus 3i would be like here. Is everybody okay with this idea? What does this remind us of, the way we just plotted these?
a vector. Yeah, where a vector has like an X component and a Y component. A complex number has a real component and an imaginary component. So the way that we would add two complex numbers would be the same way we would add two vectors, right? So say we wanted to add 2 minus i and 2 plus i. What's that going to result in? How do we add vectors? Hannah? Okay, you could think about it that way. So if you wanted to think about it visually. We have uh, 2 minus i. That's kind of like the head. And then we're going to go 1 over and two up from there, one over, one, two up. And that's like the next vector. Let me just put that up at a different spot so it's a little less ambiguous. So this guy then would be two minus i plus one plus two i. And that position is, how many over did we go? Three, and how many up did we go? One. So you can think about it that way, right? How else could we think about this though? Add the real parts, add the imaginary parts. You just treat the eye like a variable and we'd get the same result. Everybody okay there? So when we talked about absolute value of a real number, the absolute value, one definition that we might have given was it's just the distance from zero on the number line, right? Everybody's okay here? So if I extend this to a complex number, say this is just the complex number a plus bi, it's going to be the distance from the complex number to the origin That, because the origin is going to be acting like the zero on our number line, right? What does this remind us of in vector speak? What is that distance from the head of the vector back to the origin in vector speak? That's the magnitude. And how did we find the magnitude of the vector? the square root of x squared plus y squared. So for a complex number a plus bi, 
its magnitude would be a squared plus b squared. Now there's a fun name that we use for um, the absolute value when we talk about like other um, systems other than something that would be on a number line. That's the term modulus is like a little bit of a um, more general term than absolute value. Absolute value applies only to real numbers. Modulus would apply to, you know, like a two-dimensional system, a three-dimensional system, a four-dimensional system, etc. Um, or even the term norm might be used. That's another term that could be used interchangeably there. Okay. Um, so if we think back to vectors still, thinking about the complex numbers like a vector, there are two big attributes for vectors, right? There's magnitude, and the other thing was direction. What if we wanted to find the direction for that complex number? What could we say? Well, just that tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, or the horizontal component over, or I'm sorry, the vertical component over the horizontal component. And that's something now we've talked about how to find like a direction that ain't solve for an angle like that a bunch of different times, right? We did it in first semester, we've done it with vectors, we did it again with polar things. It's come up a bunch. Um, but now, what we have another representation Oh my goodness, guys. Why did I write A over B? Yeah, it definitely should be B over A. Well, how come you didn't say anything if you knew better? We all have our moments, right? I just made one. But good on you for at least thinking like, that doesn't seem right. Um, we call this kind of representation the trigonometric form. So let's do an example. The most common kind of question now that we've established that there's two ways to represent something is how do we move back and forth between those two, right? So I would start by just drawing a picture of what's going on. So negative 2, 5 would be up here. 
So we need to find r and theta in order to write our trigonometric form. Everybody's cool? How do we find r? Well, we just take the magnitude of the vector. Notice that when we do that, I don't include the i. It's just a and b. So that's the square root of 29. And 29 is a prime, so I know I can't further reduce that radical at all. And then theta, I know to find theta, what I'm going to do is calculate alpha. I know theta is going to be, oh, we're asking for it in radians. So it'll be pi minus alpha. Instead of 180. And alpha is going to just be tan inverse of B over A or tan inverse of the absolute value of, I should say. All right, you gotta remember those absolute values. Or you can just remember to just make everything positive and just regular old tan inverse. That's how I type into the calculator. Just because it's not worth jumping through the hoops to get the absolute value symbol. I'm pretty sure I can drop negative signs all on my own. I don't need the calculator to help me do that. Uh, better make sure I'm in radiant mode. Okay, good. So I get a 195. So that's everything I need. And then don't forget your i as your coefficient on your sign. So I stuck that i in there. But that's it. It's the exact same procedure that we use to write the magnitude and direction for vector. Woo! I love it when something new is like, oh, this is really the same stuff just over again, right? That is rad. Thank you very much. Nice and easy. All right. Um, continuing on. So there's two other operations that we'd like to be able to do with our numbers. Multiplication and division. So if I have like Two complex numbers, a plus bi times c plus di. If I wanted to add, multiply those two together, what am I going to have to do? Nope. They have to FOIL, right? Because we just have like two binomials multiplying together. This is just like a FOIL problem. It's okay. It's early, right? It's early. And I love that we're trying. So I'd have something that looks like this, right? What do you notice there that I can simplify? I squared, what's I squared? Equals negative one. So this would be like the complex number AC minus BD plus the imaginary component AD plus BCI. Now the hassle about this is every time I want to multiply two complex numbers together, 
I have to FOIL, right? So if I have like 10 complex numbers that I'm multiplying together, I just keep having to FOIL over and 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 over. This becomes pretty tedious. I wonder if using the trigonometric form might unlock a different way. And I'm just going to use TF as trigonometric form. Okay, so if I do Z1 times Z2, I'd have this, right? And you're probably thinking, Mr. Kulik, this looks worse. Well, let's just write it out and see. Sometimes it's darkest before the dawn, and things are going to get way uglier before it turns into like, oh, a really nice formula just tumbles right out of there for me. Let's just give it a chance. Maybe something nice will happen. And then at this point, you're thinking to yourself, okay, Mr. Kulik, we're not doing this just for funsies. I know something nice is going to happen. Like, can we just cut to the chase? No, we have to pretend like we're doing it the first time. That's how this works. Okay. So if I multiply these two things together, the R1 and the R2 can just multiply together. But the trig parts have to foil, right? So we'd have cosine theta 1 times cosine theta 2 plus i cosine theta 1 sine theta 2 plus i uh, cosine theta 2 sine theta 1 plus i squared sine theta 1 sine theta 2. And then that guy is just negative 1. Remember, I squared. So now I'm going to rearrange this just like I did before. It's the same idea as above. And so far, you're like, Mr. Kulik, this is the same thing you did above. It's just like stupider because I have all these like extra trig things that I have to write out and it's like a lot of extra writing and I don't see any extra benefit here. Like I don't get why you're having us do this. It seems just the same as what you did before except worse because it's just trig things that I'm foiling instead of just regular old numbers. Well, okay, fair enough, but look at this. And then also, while we're at it, look at this. Do those look familiar? They should. They are identities. Yes. That is it correct. Do you remember which identity they are? They are sum and difference ones. Great. This one is the sum of angles for cosine. And this is the sum of angles for sine. And hold on a second, Mr. Kulik. What did we just find here? Look at the formula that we've just come up with now.
that if I want to multiply two complex numbers in trigonometric form, all I have to do is multiply their angles or their uh, magnitudes and add their directions. And I'm done. No foiling actually necessary here. Oh, that's not too bad then. If I have to multiply like 10 of these things together, that is a piece of cake. There's no repeated foil, 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 simplify, foil, simplify, foil, simplify. No, man, I can do it all in one shot. <sighs> yes. Make my life easier. That's what I'm talking about. I guess this was malt up here. Okay, let's talk about division now. So when we wrote them in our normal complex number form, who remembers how to divide two complex numbers from algebra 2 last year? You multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by... Close, the conjugate of the denominator, which now means you're foiling the top and bottom. Yuckaruskis, but fine. I guess I can do that. Um, so I get AC minus ADI plus BCI. Um, minus BDI squared over C squared minus CDI plus CDI minus DI squared. And well, hey, I noticed that happens. That's nice at least. And that needed to happen because remember I squared is negative one. That's the part that's going to get the imaginary part out of the denominator, which is what we needed to have happen. And we're left with AC plus BD plus uh, BC minus ADI. And ugh, gag me, right? Like that's a hassle. That's what you did last year. Does that look familiar? Yeah, it wasn't fun, was it? Well, what happens if instead we use the trigonometric form? And remember, converting these to trigonometric form was not a hassle, right? It was not too big of a deal. It was just doing that vector stuff that we've done before. Here's the beautiful thing. Remember when we multiplied two things in trigonometric form? We multiplied their magnitudes and added their directions, right? What do you think division is going to be? Divide their magnitudes and subtract their directions. Oh my goodness, Mr. Kulik, is that it? Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. How much easier does that make life? That's going to make life a lot easier. And my life is hard enough, you know, guys? Like, anytime good old trigonoma trigonometry can come along and uh, make my day a little bit easier, that is a good stinking day. All right. Z1 times Z2, answer in both trigonometric and standard form. Oops. Z1 times Z2. Z1 times Z2. Sounds like you should be saying it with like an Italian accent or something. Or like Borat. 
Do you guys still watch Borat? No, that one missed you guys. It's okay. It's a big deal for like a minute. Boom, trigonometric form. Do I even have to show any work to do that? No, oh, man. Straight to the answer. Pretty darn cool. How am I going to get my standard form answer? Well, dude, I'm just going to my calculator. I'm just going to multiply that stuff out. Got to make sure I turn it back to degree mode. Oops, degree mode. So 28 times cosine 185. That's my A. And then 28 times sine 185. I'll tack the I on myself by hand. Negative 244. Negative 244. Woo! Very nice, right? That is, Mr. Kulik, that is like piece of cake territory. I know. I know. Isn't it grand? Not like we talked about that vector chapter being like kind of the worst chapter. But here's the best part about it is just like, so much of second semester is like the same idea, just we're going to put a different packaging on it. But it's like the same thing over and over again, which is why I think it like gets easier as it goes. Because these skills, ideally, you learn them once and just like, oh, we're just doing this again. <laughs> I'm pretty good at that, you know. All right. Um, so Z1 divided by Z2. Okay, well, 14 divided by 2, that's 7. Cosine of pi over 3 minus pi over 7. What do I need to do that? Pi over 3 minus pi over 7. Common denominator, right? What would the common denominator be? 21. So that's going to give me 4 pi over 21. And then I got to go back and put a parenthesis in here, right? Forgot that at first, but. Mr. Kulik, this is not bad. I love it when it's almost like we take something that looks like it's going to just be like a giant pain in the butt and we turn it into like a mental math problem that is a good good day and if i want my standard form answer what do i do yeah just multiply that stuff out i go back to my calculator here i gotta remember to change my mode back in my infinite wisdom now i have back to radians but seven times cosine four pi divided by 21 that number 578 and I'll just update that to sine 394 so 578 plus 394 I bingo bango bongo we are donezos how about that you feeling everybody's feeling okay no big deal so far, right? We just established a conversion between standard form to trigonometric form. We talked about how to add or subtract and do the absolute value and find the direction. Now we have these two shortcuts for multiplying. If you put it just into the trigonometric form, it becomes a pretty trivial problem and getting it back out of trigonometric form is just like typing stuff into my calculator to multiply it out. It's very easy. All right, um, last thing here for today, 
we're going to talk about powers and roots of complex numbers. Okay, so let's start with powers here first. And let's say z is just the complex number in the trigonometric form, r times cosine theta i sine theta. Let's just start and kind of build out a formula here inductively. So if I did z squared, well that's z times z. So that just would be, uh, you know, like r times r and then cosine theta plus theta plus i sine theta plus theta or just r squared cosine 2 theta plus i sine 2 theta, right? Feel okay there? If I did z cubed, well that's just z squared times z, right? And we know what z squared is because we just found it. So apply that same multiplication formula. And at this point, who's got the pattern? If I just asked you for the formula for z to the n, it's going to be r to the n times cosine of n theta, very good, plus i sine n theta, and we're done. Is that really it, Mr. Kulik? Imagine trying to do that with standard form. If I gave you like 2 plus 3i to the 17th. Oh my God, I want to die. Because all you can do is just foil that over and over again, one multiplication at a time, 17, well, 16 times. Oh my God, kill me now, right? But look at this. But look at the time saver there. That's something you could, we convert that to trigonometric form, not hard to do. Formula, done. Yes. Um, just FYI, this formula here has a name. It's called De Mauvray's theorem. So let's do this. 2 plus 3i to the 17th, right? Let's just do that. First thing I want to do is I want to convert to trigonometric form. So r is just going to be the square root of 13. And then theta, I can tell this is in what quadrant if I plotted this. First quadrant. So alpha is just equal to theta, right? So tan inverse 3 over 2. And that's a radian number, obviously, right? Everybody's cool with that. 
So this equals square root 13 cosine of 0.98 plus i sine 0.98 to the 17th. Or square root of 13 to the 17th times cosine of 17 times 0.98 plus i sine 17 times 0.98. And then it's just calculator time, the dudes. Square root 13. And since I gave you this example in standard form, let's write our answer in standard form because this is not going to be a nice looking, um, not a very nice looking answer there if I give it in uh, trigonometric form. You know what I'm saying? Woo, that's a biggie. That's what I get, I suppose, for just like making something up on the fly. It's to the 17th, though, so I'm not surprised it's a like a bonkers big number. And I can't use the ants command because my answer I want is way back here. Woo! I'm going to need to minimize this so I can see the calculator at the same time. That is too many digits to remember. Negative 1590277918 plus, I, or, well, we put the I at the end. I guess I should write minus, huh? Minus 2474152796I. All right. But still, like, was that, imagine if you tried to do it in standard form. Still going. Still be multiplying. Just keep foiling over and over again. Yuck, 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 yuck. Okay. Um, what about roots now? Who would have thought you can like square root a complex number, or take the seventh root of a complex number? That seems kind of a little surprising that we can do that, right? And maybe there's no uh, no obvious um, way of thinking about this, but let's go back and just recall. So remember back to algebra 2, if I want to take the nth root of something, that's the same as what exponent? Like the 1 over n, right? The square root is to the 1 half, the cube root is to the 1 third. So if I take de Moivre's theorem, oops, where did that go? There it is. Grab that. Scoot it down a little bit. Make it a little bigger. But instead of doing this as n, we just replace the n's with 1 over n's. We'd expect this, right? Seems like that should be okay to do. Everybody okay with that? Agreed? Close. Close. We're almost there.
Well, Mr. Kulik, uh, what's what's the problem? Anybody see what the problem is? It has to do right in here. No, the fraction there's okay. That's not a problem. Nope, and in the denominator is fine. Well, that's there's no such thing as the zeroth root of anything either. So can't and can't be zero if we're doing the if this is the proxy for a for a radical. Here's the here's the catch. Um, if I have um, Say I do like cosine of 90 over 2, and I do cosine of 450 over 2. What are those going to be? They're both going to be the same. Because 90 and 450 are coterminal, right? So we're actually going to be getting multiple answers here that we have to account for. Okay? So this guy is going to change. Again, we'll assume this, we'll write this in degree, this formula in degrees, since that was the example I just gave was in degrees. If it was in radians, what would we have to change the, th the 360s to? Two, pi. Two pies. Yep, good. And then we don't need infinitely many k's. k is going to be fixed, and it's going to be related to the number of the radical. So we start from 0, and we count out to n minus 1. So if you do a third root, you should get three answers. If you do a tenth root, you should get 10 answers. If you do a 126th root, should get 126 answers. Yeek! It's fine. It's not a big deal. So let's do a couple of examples. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. Find the cube root of 3 minus 2i and then give our answers in standard form. What's the first thing I'm going to do? What form is my complex number in? Standard form. What form do I want it to be in to do anything with it? Trigonometric form. What am I going to do first? Convert it to trigonometric form, right? So we'll find the magnitude. That's quite easy. And then we need the direction. What quadrant is this going to be in? It's the fourth quadrant, right? So we need to make a decision. Do we want to do this in radians or degrees? 
Does it matter? It does not, right? You pick whichever one you're more comfortable with. I like degrees. Let's just do degrees. Everybody okay with that? Okay. So this guy over here is going to be my alpha. So my theta is just going to be 360 minus alpha, which is the tan inverse of the absolute value of negative 2 over 3. Type that into the old calculadora. And I don't remember anymore. Did I have that? I didn't have it in degree mode. Whoa, buddy. Better change that before I press enter. So 326.31. Okay, so the cube root then of 3 minus 2i is going to be the cube root of the square root of 13 times cosine of 326.31 plus 360 times 0 over 3 plus i sine 326.31 plus 360 times 0 over 3. I know I don't need to put the time 0 in there, but so this is my k equals 0 answer. My next solution it's going to be the same thing, but where k equals 1. When you're doing this in practice, there is no good darn reason to write all these out. Just put a k in there and then it says k equals 1, 2, 3, or 0, 1, 2. You know what I mean? Because all I'm doing is writing the exact same thing but replacing like the 0 with a 1. And I'm going to do the exact same thing and replace the 0 with a 2. And then do the exact same thing and replace the zero. No, that's it, because there's only three answers. But you get the idea, right? This is just like me doing a bunch of grunt work so that it's really clear to you like what I'm doing. The next time we do this, I'm going to do it, uh, show my work a little bit more compactly. But I don't want to uh, confuse anybody as to like, what exactly is Mr. Kulik doing here? All right. Um, so what is the cube root of the square root of 13? How do I simplify that? Oh, guys. We'll just convert these all into exponents. Square root of 13 is 13 to the 1 half. The cube root is to the one-third. So how do I do an exponent of an exponent? This is an algebra 2 question. I just multiply the exponents. So that's 13 to the one-sixth, which is just the sixth root of 13. So the way you can think about this is you can just multiply the indices Feel okay there? And there I'll just do the times zero and then add that. And here I'm just going to add 360. And we'll add 360 again. Uh, let's see. 10, 4, 6, 3, 1, I think.
Okay. And now we just need to uh, grind out to get our standard form answers. Oh boy, I didn't mean to minimize it all the way. I just wanted to do that. Okay. Still in degree mode. So I'll do sixth root. Do you remember how to do a sixth root on your calculator? Uh, one sixth. Yes, you could do it that way. Or you can do like this command in the math menu and it'll let you write it in so it looks like a radical. They both do the same thing. Either way is fine. And I'll do cosine of this guy divided by 3. And then I'll do cosine of, oops, Okay, let's type this in a little bit smarter. That was fine what I did, but I want to type it in smarter so I can just like recursively just update this so I don't have to go back and like type a million numbers in all over the place. So we'll do it this way, cosine of, and I'll do the fraction command. And then I'll retrieve that number because I want that number in there all the time. So there's my first real component. And then I'm just going to do the real component for the next one. So I'm just going to recall that last thing that I typed in. Oh, come on now. Stop being difficult. And then just tack on a plus 360 in the numerator. There's my next one. And then we'll do the same thing, and it'll just change that 360 to a 720, right? Or 360 times 2, you could write that way. And that's a 1504. And just for grins, what if I uh, what if I just got carried away and didn't notice that I had like I was done, and right. What if I wrote 1080 here for my next one? Watch what happens. What do you notice I got? The same thing as the first one. So it, eventually they'll just like repeat. So if you forget how many you need, just keep going until you get the same thing back again, right? Like, no big deal. All right, so now I'm going to go back. I'll retrieve this guy, and I'm just going to update this to be sine instead of cosine. So one, four, five, two. And then I'll just go tack on a plus 360 on that for the next one. So that's a negative one five or negative one one five three. And then we'll tack on another 360 on to that one. And negative uh, 299 and there we go notice that here when we used k equals 0 1 and 2 you could have used k equals 1 2 3 you could have used k equals 7 8 9 you could use k equals 23, 24, 25, any three consecutive numbers will get you those same three answers. They might be in a different order, right? Like if you did one first, you would have gotten this one, this one would have been two, and then this one would have been three. But it doesn't matter, 
right? It's the same three answers. It doesn't matter the sequence in which you get them. Is everybody okay? All right. Let's do one more example of doing this because, again, this is, I think, the trickiest thing we've done today, right? We'll do another one, make sure we got it. So left fourth root of 16, what's the first thing I need to do? Yeah, so first kind of observe that 16 is just 16 plus zero, I. So R, well that's obviously just gotta be 16, right? 16 squared plus zero square root is just gonna be 16. And if I think about this and the um, complex plane, here's 16 is something right out here, right? What's the angle there got to be then? Zero degrees, right? Okay. Kulik, I'm liking the looks of this because this looks pretty darn easy now. So this is the way that I'm going to show my work from here on when I'm doing something like this. I'm just going to write the general answer, tell you the k's that I plugged in, and then just do it all in my calculator. I would encourage you to do the same, but I wanted to write out all the like the nitty gritty itty 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 itties so you understood what I was doing, right? Especially if you wanted to go back and look at it. Okay. So all I'm going to do is this. Well, the 4 through to 16 I can actually do in my head. What's the 4 through to 16? 2! So I'm going to just, I'll do that. If you didn't remember, if you didn't remember what that was or didn't that didn't pop out to you right away, that's okay. It's not a big deal. Just go ahead and type it in. So now I'm just going to go ahead and find my um, oh boy, find my real parts real quick. So I'm going to do all the cosine ones here in a row. So I got two, zero, negative two, and then the last one I'm expecting to see is anybody guesses zero again. I bet, yeah. So I have 2, 0, negative 2, 0. And if I did it a fourth time, I would expect to get positive 2 again. I don't expect it to repeat the, until I get to the one more than what I needed. Um, so I'll just go back now and grab that first one and change it into sign. And then we'll change the k from 0 to 1. And then from 1 to 2. And then anybody guesses the last one's going to be? I'm betting negative 2. Oh, shocker. So I have 
zero i plus two i plus zero i minus two i. And those are my answers. What do you guys think? Can I tell you something like kind of surprising? This was all of chapter 11. We just did it all today. So we'll take like, we'll do just work on homework and stuff the rest of this week. And we'll do the test at the class next week. I think we have one regular class day next week and then a next day, right? And we'll just take a, we can take like a mental break on the X day. I don't think that we really need to do anything because I don't want to start something for 45 minutes and then just have you forget it all when we go on break. That seems senseless. So what do you guys think? Fair enough? We, yeah, that's okay. Good enough news.